Hi, everyone. If you're here, let me know. Hello. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. You good. guys who are on Facebook and YouTube, let me know you're here. Send me a little message that you're here. Hi, hi. Nice to see everyone. Looks like we're having a little trouble connecting to Facebook tonight. Oh, of course, something always has to go wrong, doesn't it? I'm not sure why Let's see. it's not connecting to Facebook. I'm going to put a little message there for them to join us on Zoom. Hold on just a minute. Hmm. Oh, it looks like I'm having some issues connecting to Facebook completely. Hmm. Let me just post that. seem to be having some issues connecting to Facebook tonight. I am not sure why. My streaming software keeps saying connecting, 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 but nothing is happening. But I see we have a couple people with us on YouTube. So thank you for joining us on YouTube. And hopefully this Facebook thing will resolve itself in the next minute or two. I'm gonna give it a couple more minutes. I'm not sure what the problem is. This always connects properly. Usually if I have any trouble, it's on the YouTube side or the Zoom side. So of course tonight the problem has to be something completely different or you know it wouldn't be Mrs. Q live. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, I can see, wow. I can see it on YouTube and Zoom. still nothing on Facebook. Oh, well, I'm going to get started. Hopefully people will join us, come over from Facebook and join us here. Oh, I see a bunch of people are coming over from Facebook. So good. Let's give people a chance to come over from there since I'm not sure what's happening over there. Oh yeah, a bunch of people are coming in. Great. Hi, everybody who's joined us tonight from Facebook that isn't working. I'm sorry about that. I'm gonna give people a few minutes to come into the Zoom meeting room. Okay, now we have people here. So tonight, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on over there. I keep, I'm looking at my streaming monitor and it seems to, seems to be showing the same scene over and over again. So I'm not sure what's happening. I think I, I'm not going to look at it. That way I, I won't be distracted by it. Let's put it over here. I'm going to, okay. So I can see your messages and I can see Facebook still hasn't connected. So I'm going to get started. So thank you everybody for joining me tonight. I'm sorry I missed you last week. And for those of you who were worried, it was nothing big, just that I was under a great deal of stress for a couple of weeks and just needed to take a few days to relax. So to all of you who were worried about me, thank you so much for being concerned. And um, I'm, I'm fine. So thank you for that. Now, I do have a couple of things to tell you about tonight that are coming up before we get started on our talk about the prisons. And the first thing is July 4th weekend. Um, Please consider coming out on July 3rd, Saturday at 11 a.m. for a July 4th tour with me. 
as I will be giving a July 4th tour um, through the city of New York, a Revolutionary War tour. And if you've already taken the Revolutionary War tour, you might not want to do that because you've already heard that tour. And I have something else for you that's coming up that you'll enjoy. Um, but if you haven't taken the Revolutionary War tour and you're in the New York City area or you are in New York, um, let me know. Where did my chat go? I keep losing things tonight. I'm so sorry. Oh, here it is. I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. Maybe it's all me. So if you're in New York City, you're going to be visiting New York City over July 4th weekend. Um, you can go to patriottoursnyc.com and buy tickets for that July 3rd tour, which I will be doing um, completely in costume. And for those of you who have been following my um, to those of you who've been following my uh, doing a tour in full costume exploits, I did today find a pair of new shoes to wear on my tour, a nice pair of red shoes that I'm going to try to fix up to uh, pass for 18th century shoes because there is no way I can continue to do that tour in 18th century shoes. I do the tour and I wind up spending the rest of the day with my feet and a foot massage soaker thing. So that is it for those shoes. I'm not gonna be using them anymore. I found a nice pair of canvas shoes I'll be wearing and fixing them up to look appropriate. And I'll hold on to those shoes for events that require full authenticity. Um, so, so, so much for those shoes in the future. So um, if you're in the New York City area, please think about coming on my July 3rd tour. If you've already taken my Revolutionary War tour and you're in the New York City area, I am inviting you to join us for this event, which you may have seen already, which is July 9th. Oh, look at me, it's, I'm covering it up. Um, in, in cooperation with Francis Tavern, I and some of New York's finest history reenactors will be out on July 9th, the very night the Declaration of Independence was read in New York City in 1776, and we will be reenacting those events, including the tearing down of the statue, and I'm not going to tell you how we're going to do that, so you have to come and find out. Um, this is a fully immersive walking tour, which means there are going to be people all along the route of the tour that you will be meeting from 1776 New York and be interacting with along the way. There also are going to be people within the group who will be in period costume and in character who you can speak to as we move from stop to stop. So I will be starting the tour, giving you an introduction of what was going on in July of 1776. And uh, then we will be watching the reading of the Declaration of Independence as ordered by His Excellency General George Washington. After that, I think on the path, we will be running into my friend, Mrs. Elizabeth Middleton, who is a fine lady, but a loyalist. And she will be telling you why she is a loyalist and why she remains um, loyal to the crown. So you'll hear from her, you'll get to speak to her. And then I think we'll be running into some soldiers along the way who've come a very long distance to uh, aid New York in the defense against England. And of course, you know, you'll be speaking to my friend, His Excellency George Washington, as well as a captain in his lifeguard. And then when we get to the Bowling Green, we will be joining some true sons of liberty um, in their effort to tear down the statue of King George III. The whole thing will be lots of fun. We'll be ending the tour at Francis Tavern with a number of toasts to the general and his and his army. So for those of you who may not be interested in the tour itself, but want to participate, you can always meet us at Francis Tavern around 7.30, 7.45. We plan to get there and just join in the toasts and have a few drinks. It'll be lots of fun. And they do have a few um, period drinks on their menu. Um, Mrs. Q will be drinking the period punch. Uh, so I hope you'll all join us for that. You can get tickets at francistavernmuseum.org. Um, slash events hyphen calendar and all of those ticket sales by the way go to um the uh, francis tavern museum so it's not my tour so it's not going to my business or anything like that it is all going to francis tavern museum an excellent thing for you to support so please consider coming out the evening of july 9th i don't think anything like this has ever been done before we've been meeting about it we're having a great time 
um, working on who's going to be speaking and what's going to be happening. And you're just totally going to enjoy this experience as though you're there in 1776 for these great events. So please uh, consider coming out and joining us that evening. Now tonight, of course, you know, we're talking about, oh, before I talk about the prisons, so many of you have also contacted with me, me um, with concern about the passing of our Q dog. So I thought you would like to see this wonderful gift we received from our friends, Mr. and Mrs. B, who had a painter make this for us as our dog, as a military commander. It's quite wonderful, as you can see. And I know that some of you may may know that this dog breed does not really exist in my time. But as you know, Mr. Q is also known as the doctor and is a time traveler. And it's quite possible he brought him from the future as a puppy. So this wonderful um, painting is a uh, courtesy of our good friend, um, Mr. and Mrs. B. I wanted to show you that because I know some a lot of you are um, dog lovers yourselves. And uh, so that was a very nice thing that they did for us. So let me take this off and we will get on to our subject, um, the uh, prisons in use in New York during the occupation. So as you know, New York was occupied by the British from 1776 to 1783. And during that time, of course, they needed barracks, places to live, and they needed jails for lots of prisoners war and people that they accused of other crimes against the crown or petty crimes throughout the city. Uh, many types of buildings were used as jails. And we have in the accounts of Reverend Schaukirk, the uh, pastor of the Moravian church, that at one point they arrived at his church and said they were planning to convert his church into a jail. But Pastor Schaukirk, being friends um, with one of the commanders at that time, narrowly avoided that fate. But he does tell us that the North Dutch church was converted to a jail. And for you who know the area, that would have been at Pine and William Streets. And um, one of the families miraculously saved the bell of that church before it was taken and melted um, for weaponry by the British. And uh, I think that bell still exists in a church somewhere in the Hudson Valley in your time. So they did convert the North Dutch church to a jail. For a time, they converted the college, um, King's College into a jail, but ultimately that became a hospital and many other residences became jails. We have the um, memoir of a gentleman named Mr. Graydon, who was taken prisoner by the um, British, brought to New York, and because he had money and his family was able to send him money, he um, paid to live in a boarding house. There were a number of boarding houses that were used for jails and the prisoners there paid for their upkeep. Now they were allowed to walk around the town freely and he talks in his memoirs of many strolls he took around the occupied city and always though having to return to his boarding house at night. And of course he couldn't leave the perimeter of the occupied city. So we have many different ways in which people were held in these jails. And a lot of it did depend on your status as Mr. Graydon, of course, had a family who was able to send him the money so that he could afford a boarding house. If you were an officer, you were considered a peer of the British officers and an aristocrat, and you would um, live in a nice house or you might be kept in a nice inn during that time and you were treated with all the due respect um, afforded a gentleman. But if you were a regular, what the British considered to be a regular or a peasant, your life was not so good. So the first jail we're going to talk about tonight is the Provost Jail. And, and we do have some drawings of these jails that we can look at. So let me find the Provost for you. And that is right here. So here we have the Provost Jail, the Provost or Debtor's Prison. Before the American Revolution, this was the Debtor's Prisons located on the commons. And this is where you went if you didn't pay your debts, right? There was no bankruptcy protection in my time. In my time, if you do not pay your debts, 
it's off to debtor's prison for you. Now, we kind of had an interesting arrangement in that you were allowed to work while you were in the debtor's prison if you had a job. And once you were able to pay off those debts, you were released from the prison. And there were you know, various people who did this who went out during the day and they worked, returned to the jail in the evening, and once they paid their debts, they were released. People who had no money stayed there for many, many years. And some of those might have been widows and children or unmarried women and children or elderly who had no one to care for them. So this was originally the debtor's prison. During the war, though, this was also used for prisoners of war. And this is one of the many jails we're going to talk about tonight that was under the management of the provost marshal, or you might call him Sheriff William Cunningham. And if you have a very keen memory, you may remember that last summer I spoke about William Cunningham as one of the loyalist gentlemen that the Sons of Liberty dragged around the commons and uh, got on his knees and tried to force him to damn the king. When that didn't work, they stripped him of his clothes and left him naked and humiliated in the middle of the New York Commons. Now, Mr. Cunningham fled New York at that time, but when the British came back, he returned as well, and he became the sheriff or provost marshal throughout the seven years of the occupation. And it was then that William Cunningham set out to gain his revenge on the men of New York, particularly men who were in the Sons of Liberty that he was able to capture during that time. So so some of those men spent time in this jail. One of them you might be familiar with was Hercules Mulligan, who was one of the men who dragged uh, Mr. Cunningham around on the commons. In total, um, Cunningham had Hercules Mulligan arrested three times for spying. And each time Cunningham threw his crafty um, wit and ability to entertain mm. the British officers, managed to talk his way out. Excuse me, I have to see if Mr. Q heard that. I believe he did. Um, three times, um, um, three times Hercules Mulligan was able to talk his way out of a conviction on spying. And that again is largely due to the fact that he was considered a gentleman by the British officers who were also gentlemen. He was considered to be of their class, of their status and a peer, and he was released three times. And we all know now that he was indeed spying from his tailor emporium during that time. But a bit of cleverness got him out of the jail all three times. Now, in your time, there is a, a, a series on a video series called Turn about Washington spies. And in that series, um, Caleb Brewster is kept in a jail and brutally tortured. Now that did not happen in real life. Caleb Brewster was never captured by the English and imprisoned in New York. So that is a fictitious part of the series. But the jail that's pictured where he's kept and tortured likely was the provost prison, um, which was under the management of William Cunningham. It's a possibility also that it was the sugar house, but I think it's more likely that it was this one, as this is the one most known for William Cunningham being present there. So this was up here on the commons. Also on the commons was the Bridewell, which was the jail built as our town jail, our official town jail. Of course, that was used completely for prisoners of war during that time, many of whom died there from the elements in winter or summer or also starved there. Now, if you have any children in your family in your time who have read the book Chains by Lori Hulse Anderson about a young slave girl who lives in New York during the American Revolution, she visits her friend who's in the Bridewell Jail on the Commons. So you may know it for that book as well. And if you have children in your family and you don't have that book, I highly recommend that they read it as it is very well done and historically very accurate. So that's Change chains by Lori Hulse Anderson and you as adults might enjoy it as well. So a book for you to check out. So on the commons, we have the provost jail and we have the bridewell. If we move down into the town a bit, as I mentioned, we find some, some churches 
and um, some dwellings that are jails, but probably the one that many of you have heard about would be the Sugar House Jail. And um, I've been asked questions uh, over, over time about the Sugar House, and that would be Rhinelander's Sugar House. And if we're facing Trinity Churchyard and we look to the right side of Trinity Church or the north side of Trinity Church, this would be located to the very back of that graveyard where Church Street is in your time. Church Street, also my time today. Today, there is a long office building there, or I should say in your time, excuse me, huh? itchy. Um, in your time, there is a long office building there along the northern border of Trinity Graveyard um, where the sugar house once stood. Let's see who else is here. We have some few more people have joined us on YouTube. And since I'm seeing no comments from Facebook, I'm assuming that we are dead <laughs> Dead on arrival on YouTube, on Facebook tonight. Yes, Facebook is still not connecting. So I hope everyone sees the message to join us here. Um, so the Sugar House. Now there was the Livingston Sugar House and the Rhinelander Sugar House. And it's the Rhinelander Sugar House, which is most um, often referenced as the Sugar House Jail. This was also a brutal place where prisoners of war were held. Also people arrested by William Cunningham um, for various crimes that they may or may not have committed as Cunningham was a brutal gentleman. Now, one of the other things we know about Cunningham is that of the thousands of men who were kept in these jails, many hundreds died of starvation. Um, I think that William Cunningham often sold off the provisions as profit for himself, the provisions that were meant to go to the prisoners in the jail. We also have a couple of firsthand accounts. I don't know how accurate they are, that Cunningham also executed gentlemen for his own entertainment, either by hanging or at firing squad behind the sugar house, which is part of the reason it is so notorious. Um, Cunningham was indeed a, an extremely brutal individual. And uh, so that would have been the sugar house as you see here. I have asked, have people ask me, what was a sugar house? And it simply was a sugar storage house, a warehouse. Keep in mind that one of the most valuable commodities shipped from the colonies before the Revolutionary War was sugar, right? Sugar, tobacco, and another of, a number of other crops. Sugar was worth more than its weight in gold at that time, as England and Europe had not discovered sugar until they got to the Caribbean. And sugar was in very high demand. It was highly valuable. It was often shipped from the Caribbean to the northern colonies where it was stored, um, sometimes refined, packaged up or sometimes turned into rum, the sugar cane, and then all of that ships to England in trade. So this was Rhinelander's sugar house or a warehouse for sugar to be stored before it was shipped off to its destination. Now next that was most notorious that many of you probably have heard of are the prison ships that were docked in the East River on the Wallabout Bay. And I do have a picture of one of those for you. And of course, you probably have guessed that that is the jersey that we'll be looking at. So we have the jersey. And this is a picture from Captain Thomas Dring's um, memoir of his time on the Jersey prison ship. He drew this very uh, accurately. He drew uh, many uh, pictures of the Jersey and the interior and the layout of the Jersey. Now running out of jails on the land, the English then turned to decommissioned ships of various types. And the Jersey was um, a type of warship. Some of them were warships, some of them were merchant ships or transport ships. They were docked across from Manhattan in Wallabout Bay which is about opposite where Chinatown is in your time. So a little bit north of the colonial city of, of New York. Um, so they're docked there in Wallabout Bay and prisoners were pretty much left there to fend for themselves. Now, um, if you've ever read Thomas Dring's memoir, it is incredibly harrowing um, telling of his time on the Jersey. He talks about how he was captured and he was transported there on, on a boat. And he said that um, as the boat pulled up and the staircase came down or the, or the, I should say ramp came down for them to walk up. He said the stench from the boat was overwhelming that he nearly fainted as he was walking up the ramp. So that's your introduction to the Jersey. He arrived at night so he said when they brought him to the deck that was to be his home, he was unable really to see very much in the darkness, except um, 
mounds that he assumed were people. He had a very difficult time finding a place to even sit. He ultimately found a small spot for himself. He said when the sun came up, he saw that it was just one mass of humanity completely filling the deck he was on. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> oh. Oh. It's beautiful spring flowers, but terrible spring allergies. This lovely fan, right, given to me by someone from the future. As you know, I don't have 50 stars on my flag yet. Oh. Um, so he, he wakes up and he finds, he says that the deck is just full of suffering humanity. Um, many people who are too sick to move, the stench is outrageous. And he goes on to talk about his daily experiences on the Jersey. Um, one of the things that he does that he learns that he can do is that he can volunteer every morning to help toss the dead bodies off of the deck. So one of the things they do is they bring up all of the bodies to the top deck and they toss them off into the East River. Um, a horrible, horrible thing. But he said that this affords him an opportunity to get onto the top deck and to um, breathe air and to smoke. He liked to smoke. So he would also smoke, he said, while he was up there and look up at the sky and look over at the city. Now, he also tells us something very interesting. And that is that if you have family, they could come up to the side of the boat and, and send you money. Um, you could, you know, yeah, you'd kind of lower like a string with a little bucket on it and they could put money in, in, in it for you and you would pick it up and you would then have money to spend. Also coming up along, also coming up along the side of the ship were merchant ladies who sold things for the people on the ship and they would do the same. Um, you would tell them what you wanted. They would call up the price. You would negotiate. You would send down your little money in a basket and they would place the items you requested in that basket and you would pull them up and you would have some supplies that way. So he also got himself, you know, um, some tobacco to smoke and various supplies that he needed. Now he also talks about how the prisoners were fed. There was a cook on the ship and that he was cooking everything in a copper pot and using the salt water in which to cook the meat and the food, which of course was poisoning everyone on the ship. So one of the things that he bought from one of these um, merchant ladies was a little um, crock pot, he said, a little iron pot that he could use to cook his own food and that he would cook his food separately from everyone else's. He does tell us that all of the food was rotten. He says the meat had maggots in it when you cooked it and the bread was moldy, but that is all that they had. So of course it sounds, you know, in, in, in incredibly, you know, horrifying to all of us, but that was his eating conditions there and otherwise he would have starved. He was also able to, he was also able to, he was also able to buy some food from the ladies who came up and sold things along the side of the ship. Um, so he talks about that. He also gives an incredible story about vaccinating himself against smallpox because of course smallpox was rampant on the ships as well. So he talks about the whole process he went through vaccinating himself to smallpox. And he says he found someone on board who had full blown you know, blisters from the pox. He said he broke one of the blisters and took the pus from it, then scraped his own arm and of course inserted the pus in his own arm and then wrapped it with some fabric. He said then he developed a slight case of the smallpox but survived and after that was immune from it. So he gives a harrowing description of how that was done. So uh, all of that, of course, having his own utensils, his own comb, cooking his own food, vaccinating himself, um, taking advantage of the, the daily trip up to the deck to throw bodies in the river, just an incredible experience. And, and Captain Dring is one of the few people who did survive the Jersey, you know, and at the end of the war was freed and wrote an extensive memoir of his time there, including drawings like the one you see behind me. So truly incredible man to survive this. Um, it is believed that about 11,000 men died on these prison ships. And there were women relegated to these prison ships as well, not just men. And I just can't imagine what would have happened to a woman on one of these ships. Um, there is rumor that the woman known as 355 was captured and thrown on the Jersey prison ship, but no substantiation of that rumor. So I don't know if it's true or not, but 
that may have very well been something they would have done to her, um, a woman if they found her spine, put her on um, the Jersey or one of those ships. There was a woman, Elizabeth Bergen, who did use her status as a merchant to these ships to help a number of men escape. And um, they would uh, jump off into her boat and she would cover them with all of the canvas and put them with all her wares, cover them with the canvas and then row them over to New Jersey where they would get you know, out of the boat and escape. And she's credited with um, saving dozens and dozens and dozens of men. She was um, praised by George Washington and given a lifetime pension for her, um, for her doing this uh, for the years that she did this and all of the men that she helped. So um, there was that going on as well. In addition to the men who died on the prison ships, it's believed that Cunningham killed a few thousand in Manhattan as well. So that would give our totals approximately 15,000 prisoners of war and people accused of crimes who died in the prisons in New York during the British occupation. So a very big number, um, a, a terrible fate for everyone um, during that time. Um, if you're wondering about William Cunningham and his future, he was the last of the British to leave New York City on evacuation day of 1783, and he returned to England. Remember, there was no concept of war crimes at that time. And uh, as far as he was concerned, they were all rebels against the crown and traitors and fully deserving of the fate they met. Um, so nothing was ever done to him for um, what he did here in New York. So a terrible, terrible story about those various prisons and jails. Um, there were women who were arrested on various types of crimes who were put in jail as well, women who were arrested as thieves. There were people arrested in 1776 accused of burning the city although we know now that it wasn't arson at all, but there were people arrested and thrown in jail and accused of that arson. Um, so it was a, a horrible time. If you were put in jail, your hearing was, um, you know, not a jury of your peers, it was a military uh, court that heard you. So it was, uh, that heard your cases. So it was a um, tribunal or a number of British officers who would have sat in judgment of you. So you can guess that all of the British soldiers and officers who were arrested and charged with crimes were often found not guilty by the British officers who heard the cases against them and that the Americans were more likely to be found guilty of being thought of as traitors and criminals themselves. So it was somewhat miraculous that Hercules Mulligan had endeared himself so well to the British officers that all three times he was able to get the charges against him dismissed. So a very harrowing and um, dangerous time for anyone then who was spying or engaging in any other type of perhaps illegal activity, um, maybe, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The London trade, black market trade. We call it the London trade. You would call it black market trade. People accused of black market trading or helping out the rebels in any way could also be arrested. You might know that that is one of the things the spy Culper Sr. Abraham Woodhull um, posed as. He posed as a cabbage farmer who was selling his cabbages to the uh, British in New York and was constantly worried that he was going to be found out, that he was just using that as a cover for his spying. So anyone who was using Using that as a cover, of course, could be arrested and thrown in jail. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. Um, the English really didn't consider that. So I, it looks like we never connected to Facebook. I hope all of you who normally join me on Facebook made it over here to Zoom tonight. If you have any questions, please ask me or feel free to type them in the chat as I don't have as much to talk about as usual because they're really, um, those are the only firsthand accounts we have of the jails. And the firsthand accounts we have are pretty much repetitive um, of, of what I've told you that some gentlemen like Mr. Graydon simply um, paid to live in a boarding house during that time. Uh, some were confined and uh, it all depended on your social status. Would the Southern colonies have been more loyalist and outnumber the patriots. I think New York was the most loyalist colony of them all. I, I believe that we had the highest concentration of loyalists here. Um, many people don't realize that one of the biggest concentrations of rebels was Virginia. 
So it wasn't really as north and south as one might think. Um, New York was filled with loyalists and Virginia was filled with rebels. Virginia was extremely radical. And at the Continental Congress, Virginia was the only colony that supported Massachusetts with the Lees being in league with Mr. Adams to put forth a declaration on independency. I, I think there were loyalists as you got further into the deep south Georgia and some in South Carolina. Although once we get to the Carolinas, we have the Scots who are fighting each other, some loyal and some rebel old Scottish clans that are fighting, um, some of them divided and on both sides of the, of the issue. Were there many prisoner exchanges? <sighs> You know, that is a terrible, terrible subject that the men on the prison ships often asked and our representatives in the Congress often asked to have them exchanged. But for whatever reason, Washington did not do prisoner exchanges for the men on those ships. I don't know if that was because it was considered um, naval or some other aspect of prisoner exchanges, but no exchanges were done for the men on the prison ships. There were often prisoner exchanges done for officers, gentlemen. That was done regularly. And you might know that after the Battle of Long Island, or as you call it, the Battle of Brooklyn, um, both sides took high ranking officers in that battle. Washington himself lost Major General Lord Sterling and General Sullivan in that battle, both of whom were returned uh, later in 1776 for officers that Washington himself had also taken. So if you were an officer, it was much more likely you would be exchanged in a prisoner exchange for someone of equal value on the other side. But if you were a regular Sometimes they did those in groups, but if you were on the prison ships, it was highly unlikely that that was going to happen. I don't recall the difficulty over it, but I do recall that there were many pleas made to General Washington to do this. And for some reason, he turned it down. And I do not remember his rationale for doing so. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McCabe, Mr. and Mrs. McCabe for coming over from Facebook. I don't know what happened over there tonight. Usually if I have trouble, the trouble is on YouTube, but tonight it was on Facebook. Thank you for coming over to uh, Zoom and joining us here. There were many skeletons at Wallabout Bay, and some of you may know that they began coming up out of the, the, the mud over time. And there was a large excavation project done by the city of New York with all of those remains removed from the East River and placed in a proper tomb in Brooklyn at Fort Greene Park. And those remains are uh, there at Fort Greene. And there was also a monument there to those who lost their lives in the prison ship with an eternal flame that burns in the top. If you've never been to that monument, it's quite beautiful and it's surrounded by four um, very large, uh, beautifully carved eagles. So a very nice place to visit. The um, tomb is no longer open to the public because it is so valuable and so old, but they do have pictures in the park service uh, building there of, of what the tomb looks like. And I have some pictures of the tomb as well. Let's see. How were the prisoners poisoned on the ship? They were poisoned by the cook as the cook was using salt water to boil in a copper pot. And I myself am not familiar with the chemical problem that occurs there, but there is something that happens there when you use salt water and copper that causes the copper to leach into the water and therefore into the food that's being boiled. And that is how the people were poisoned on the ship. And, and you know, you could imagine that they're on the on the Jersey, that there was also a lot of crime and violence and other things that were occurring on there um, that, that, that were very, very horrible and, and awful. So I, I can't imagine what it would have been like for the handful of women who were confined to those ships or, you know, gentlemen who were um, small of stature and who were not of a more martial nature. I should also mention that Benjamin Talmadge's brother, Samuel Talmadge, died in the summer of 1776 on the Jersey prison ship. Someone is asking the only art piece found in his memoir. No, the ship is not the only thing in his memoir that, um, that, that uh, Captain Dring drew. There are other more detailed 
schematics of the ship in his memoir. If you, you can find it on archive.org, um, Thomas Dring, D-R-I-N-G. Where did Maine fall in sympathy? Maine at that time was a part of Massachusetts, you might know, or something called New England, that although we kind of call it Maine, New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, um, that was all considered one big block at that time. And uh, they were um, highly rebellious throughout that area from Rhode Island to the north find a very heavy concentration of rebels there, mainly because they were so dependent on shipping and some of them like Rhode Island dependent on the sugar from the, the sugar cane from the Caribbean for the rum trade. Um, so we find a great deal of, uh, of rebels through that area as well. But, but wherever you find a high concentration of loyalists, of course, you're going to find more people loyal to the crown. So in New York, you find more loyalists as there's quite a, a lot of business in New York and a lot of reason for many English to be in New York. New York being the foremost port at that time and um, the wealthiest city in the colonies. You'll also find a great deal of loyalists in Philadelphia. Am I in my summer attire? Well, I haven't worn my silk chemise a la reine very often. So I decided to wear it for you tonight because I don't wear it that often. And it is uh, quite heavy, <laughs> quite heavy silk. And um, I <laughs> it is a bit cool in here, so it isn't too bad. So I don't think I would be wearing this on a tour in the summer because it is, this silk is quite heavy. I think it is more a fall or winter silk. As you may also know, I have also found that quite a lot of my cotton dresses are too hot for New York City in the summer. And I will be working on a few new uh, pieces of my wardrobe for my summer tours. I'm expecting some fabric on Monday um, to make a new dress to wear for July 9th. So if you're a fan of my outfits, come on July 9th as I will be debuting an entirely new outfit on July 9th. Of course, appropriate to a lady of my status in 1776. And when you meet Mrs. Middleton, she is a wealthy loyalist and she is going to be dressed very nicely as well. Everyone that night will be dressed according to their um, status and, and role. So you'll get to see people in many different types of costumes in that reenactment. I should also tell you, by the way, I am growing out my hair to wear it that night, July 9th. And this is my hair tonight. I got it all the way up here. So it is getting longer. I hate having long hair, but I'm going to let the whole thing grow out just so that I can have a magnificent curly, you know, updo for July 9th for all of you. So I'm, I'm, I'm suffering with my heavy curly hair this summer, just so that it will look fantastic that night. I may even have my hairstylist put it in and updo that afternoon for me. So, you know, we'll see. I can show her a picture and she'll do it for me. So, so I am, you know, growing it out. We'll see how that goes. Would families be able to claim their son's body when they died? They were all tossed overboard. I don't think the British cared whatsoever who anybody was. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, I'm not sure, but if someone here knows better, I don't think the Talmadge ever recovered Samuel Talmadge's body. You know, I don't think so. I don't recall that part of Benjamin Talmadge's memoir that well. If, if anyone knows otherwise, please let me know. But I don't think they recovered his body. Um, that They were just told from the list of prisoners that, that he had died. So I, I don't think they recovered him. Of course, they never recovered um, Nathan Hale either, even though he died, you know, on the land, they never recovered him either. I would guess that, you know, if you had a family member who was visiting the ship, giving you money, maybe if the officers aboard the ship that were tending the prisoners recognized you and knew your loved one died, maybe there was a possibility, you know, that they would lower him down to you and you could take him. Um, I don't know that anyone said that happened, but you know, it's possible that they may have done that if they recognized you and knew your loved one had died and that they had not yet thrown the body off of the ship, they may let you take him. 
it, it's horrible. You know, it's difficult in our time, the 21st century, to really understand the mindset of the 18th century and the class structure and the um, mentality of being born in England versus being born in America. So even loyalists who were born in America were not considered on the same level as the English who were here and born in England. They were different people, they spoke differently, they had different customs, they were from a different land. And it's really hard for us, especially Americans who are used to many different people coming together to live together to really understand the rigidity of that system. Um, that is part of what Hercules Mulligan used to get off on his charges, that he knew that if the British officers accepted him as one of them, they would never find him guilty of anything. And that is simply the way it worked. Um, there's a reason, you know, the, the saying, an officer and a gentleman, right? There was a saying at that time that if you needed to deal with the British military, you would look for an officer to deal with because they said the officers surely are gentlemen while the regulars are savages. That idea coming from the fact that the officers were all aristocrats whose sons were educated from a young age, who were sent to the various boarding schools throughout England, who had the equivalent of a college education, who were very mannerly and uh, very well schooled in society and how to behave properly. So those were the officers where the, you know, the, the, the regulars were just peasants. Some of them were people let out of jail. Um, what would you rather do, stay in jail or go fight in the army? They would go fight in the army. Um, many were people who had an option to fight in the army rather than live in the street and, and beg for money. You know, so um, many of them were really rough. There was an even and the person who told me this story may be in our Zoom meeting tonight. I'm not sure if you are you might want to assist me with the telling of this story. But there was even a British commander around, along the way who saw the British regulars and, and commented about what savages they were. And, and, and that he said that, well, I'm, I'm relieved that at least they are our savages. And I think the person who told me that story may be in the Zoom room tonight with us. That if you are, you might want to elaborate on that story. There is also someone in the Zoom meeting tonight who I wish could make it for July 9th because I know that he has a fondness for toppling English statues erected on pillars, particularly one that was erected in Ireland. And I know he's watching tonight, he's in the Zoom room tonight, and it would be such a pleasure if the Mr. and Mrs. who know who I'm talking about um, could make it for this July 9th event, as I know that the Mr. has a fondness for this type of activity. And of course, you know, we can't put up a pillar with a statue on it, but we will be doing something equally fun, and we will be... Um, shall I maybe give you a hint, using the head of the statue as well. So you don't want to miss it. I assure you nothing like it has been done before. <laughs> it is a Mrs. Q and Friends special event. Um, let me see if I missed any other questions here. I don't think I did. Oh, Mrs. McCabe is uh, talking about the Virginia flag. The Virginia flag is an excellent flag. Um, someone asked about Abraham Woodhull. Abraham Woodhull was never in prison either. And the Abraham Woodhull, as portrayed in turn, really was not that close to the original character. The original um, Abraham Woodhull was an even bigger curmudgeon and even more difficult to deal with and extremely skittish. And uh, he was not married to his uh, brother's fiance. He was single uh, throughout. He didn't get married until after the American Revolution. And he did not have an affair with Anna Strong, um, whose husband, uh, Celia Strong, uh, was in the Congress. Anna Strong was much older than him. She did pose as his wife, though, to come into New York. Um, did pose as his wife, but um, most of the characters in turn 
were not that true to the people they really were. And as a matter of fact, in one of our planning meetings for our July 9th event, um, we actually had a discussion about how disgraceful it was to name the character Simcoe, John Simcoe, as the true General John Simcoe on the English side was not brutal at all. And he was a fine gentleman, very well educated, and that it was a travesty that they named that character um, Simcoe. They should have named him Tarleton or something like that. But using the name Simcoe really was um, out of line. We had a little discussion about that. And also you may not have noticed, but when Benjamin Talmadge was injured in New Jersey. A woman found him in her barn and nursed him back to health. And her name was Livingston and she was a Tory. And there is no way you would find a Tory in New Jersey with the name of Livingston. So she should have been a, um, a Whig or a Patriot or she should have had a different name, perhaps De Philippe's or another name like that or Delancey. But they really should not have called her Livingston. So um, there were um, quite a lot of errors in turn, but taking all of that into account, it's still great and I've watched it twice. So it's still fun to watch. Another thing we talked about, Turn, Major John Andre, and the fact that Turn has made John, Major John Andre a love symbol for so many American ladies, how tragic. A horrible person like Major John Andre, who would have ruined the American Revolution, now being seen as a fantasy love interest on the part of American ladies. Unbelievable. And, and I can only say that that is due to the incredible talent of the gentlemen who have portrayed him, who even even a few times almost convinced me that I could fall in love with him. And then I realized, oh, Mrs. Q, this is John Andre we're talking about. Please um, direct your attention back to Major Talmadge. <laughs> what was the final accepted date of our independence? It was the signing of the Treaty of Paris at the end of 1783. And I do not know the exact date, although the British evacuated New York on November 25th, which would have been close to the date it was signed. So it would have taken a few weeks for news to get here. So let's say it was, someone knows the date, let me know. I would say September, October, 1783 with the final signing um, of the Treaty of Paris, um, the talk which of course, the king did not attend, refused to attend, and he sent uh, a gentleman in his place. So that was that was the final recognition of our independence. Took a long time after the end of the war. And you may have seen there's a famous painting of the signing of the Treaty of Paris with the British gentlemen's faces all fogged out as they did not want their faces remembered in the painting. So only the American faces are shown in the painting and the British faces are all smudged out as they did not want to be remembered as having had to attend um, the Treaty of Paris and sign it because it was so embarrassing to them. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I'll show my American flag again. Just, <laughs> oh, Miss Healy, this is Healy, I love you. It's so much fun. <laughs> Wave my American flag here so much for the British, right? So I'd like to know, since we have a few minutes, what is going on in your time, the 21st century, that so many Americans are so interested in the exploits of the British royal family? Can someone please ex explain this insanity to me that, that how anyone in the United States of America could care at all about the exploits of a demented, crazy old family ruling over Britain. And my friends in Britain, why do you still have a royal family? Maybe that is more to the question. Why do you still have them? I simply do not understand these things. The, the, the interest in the royal family completely puzzles me. So if anyone has an explanation, please let me know what that is all about. They have become celebrities in your time. Well, you know, in my time, we will not even dine with performers. 
or what you call celebrities. We will not dine with them, be seen in the same inn with them, right? I see you're nodding, Mrs. Healy. Not be seen in the same inn with them, not dine with them, um, not be seen in close company with them ever. I, I suppose things have changed. Oh, we have not forgotten our mother simply because we no longer live in her house. Um, well, Mr. Linton, you might remember that many of us, like me and Mr. Q, our families never came from England. And we had no affinity for England as being our mother country, that New York was filled with Dutch, French Huguenots, Spaniards, and Portuguese people from other places who really had no affinity to the British crown and never thought of England as our mother country. So there is some of that here in all of us New Yorkers as well. Of course, you know, you can see, of course, I do not look English at all. I can't even disguise myself as looking English. I clearly am some sort of, you know, European Mediterranean something. I maybe could pass for French, maybe with the right makeup, but clearly not English or Scottish or Irish. So thank you all for joining me tonight. Um, I missed you all last week. I will be back next Friday with more hair, I hope, even more hair, bigger hair. And I really hope that you'll join me on either July 3rd for the Revolutionary War Tour or July 9th. There are only 30 tickets for that July 9th event because it is an immersive event where you will all be part of the event yourselves as well. You'll all be taking part in it. So um, we're limited to 30 people. So if you want to come, please be sure to uh, get your tickets soon. Everyone have a great week and uh, I will see you um, next Friday. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great week, everyone.